Here are just a few examples. If you have just greenhouse gases, you would expect the troposphere. This is the north pole to the south pole. You would expect the troposphere to warm. You would expect the stratosphere to cool. Uh, and that's because uh, the, the low wave radiation is being absorbed in the lower part of the atmosphere more than the gas. If you have a volcanic eruption, you would expect the troposphere, that where we live, to actually cool. And the stratosphere would warm where you have these uh, sulfates and aerosol uh, particles. And then you can say, well, if there's something going on in the sun, then we would expect these two layers of the atmosphere to behave the same way, because the energy is coming from the outside. And then with models, you can put all this together and see what you would expect. But you can go out and see okay, what's actually been happening. Here is the lower uh, temperatures in the lower stratosphere since the 1950s. You can see they've been going down, except for when we have major eruptions, like the Delta the Chong and the Tuba. And they go up for a short period of time because there's loaded energy up there and the temperatures down the surface are lower. Uh, if you go down to the, to the troposphere, temperatures have been uh, rising in the upper troposphere, the lower troposphere, and on the surface of the planet. And those, are, those are the facts. So the stratosphere is cooling while the troposphere and the surface are warming in concert. This cannot be due to the sun, and is predicted by the climate models. And, and so that's the way you get some uh, confidence in, in what you're looking at and what the course of is. But my greatest confidence comes from the fact that there are thousands of climate scientists, and if they could find any other force that would explain what they're saying, they, they would win the Nobel Prize. And they have so if you ever go to the National Academy, when you go into Inner Square, you see this, this figure. This is the CO2 curve. All students started measuring uh, back in uh, 1956. So this is the CO2 levels in our atmosphere. You can see the rise that's taking place. Well, we can use the ice cores to look at the longer term history of CO2. We have records from Antarctica that go back 800,000 years. And the bubbles in the ice track the atmosphere in the past. So you can extract those gases and you can measure CO2 and methane, the nitrous oxide, uh, Anything in the atmosphere is in those bubbles. So they're kind of an archive of the past. So if you look at that archive, if we have methane uh, in red, CO2 in blue, you see that there is a 100,000 uh, year cycle that occurs. Uh, this is due to orbital forcing. Uh, in fact, that our planet's uh, uh, orbit is not in a circle, it's an ellipse. And depending on where you are, uh, you either get more radiation from the sun or you get less radiation. Uh, when um, we are cold, and this place where we're talking is under an ice sheet, CO2 levels were about 180 to 200 parts per million of water. Uh, during warm periods, when the ice melts back, it gets up to about 300 parts per million. Uh, if we look at where we are today, there is no analog for these gases in this long term carbon. And the real concern here is where we are projected to be by 2100 AD. Now, you don't hear a lot of discussion about methane because it has a very short residence time of only 10 to 12 years in the atmosphere. CO2, on the other hand, remains in the atmosphere for decades, for millennia. And so once it's released, we will continue to alter the climate as we go forward in the future. And this is kind of disturbing because if we were to stop all CO2 emissions today, this would be the the K curve in the atmosphere. So if you look out 100 years, you still have 33% of that CO2 in the atmosphere. If you look out 1,000 years, you still have about 20% of that CO2 in the atmosphere, in fact, in climate. Now, Charles Keeling passed away in 2005. They continued to measure these CO2 levels in Montevallo. And you can see the rise, and I checked the uh, for August, the mean values were 292.41 parts per million by volume. So the curve continues. Even though there's been a lot of activity, people trying to reduce the carbon footprint, in the big scheme of things, we are not winning this battle. And part of this is population driven and how rapidly that population has grown, where it's projected to be by 2050. You often see these, these numbers. But sometimes you don't see the, the numbers that are required to support these people. 
Uh, if you look at uh, in 2012, there were 17 billion fowl, chickens, and dogs, uh, 1.9 billion sheep and goats, and uh, 400 million dogs, 500 million cats. I mean, it, you know, we have a huge impact on all of those plants. And then you can contrast this to the pre exploitation numbers of the American bison, which was put out 60 to 80 million. So we're really having an impact on, on the system. And you can see that if you're in space. Uh, uh, all these are lights from the cities, uh, and mostly that's uh, fossil fuel uh, electricity, 65% uh, in, in the today's world. That was an energy conference with General Electric, and they had a projection of what the world will look like in 2030. And you can see it here. And the real question is, where is this energy going to come from? And if it's fossil fuels, Glaciers I don't want to talk about will be gone. Uh, but uh, we, we do have uh, alternatives. We're fortunate to live on the planet where there are many reporters in our past. And what we really need is a long term perspective on the planet. And, uh, and we need all of these. Uh, we, we concentrate on ice cores that come from glaciers. And uh, we believe that to be one of our best reporters. Uh, it's a physical body, uh, it's not subject to. Any type of growth or changes that might come from the organism itself. So it's a, it's a, it's a good report. In the polar regions, we have records that go back, one I showed, 800,000 years. Uh, now in the tropics, and, uh, due to the efforts of the here at Ohio State, we have records that go back 25,000 years. Uh, the resolu uh, resolution of the tropical records is much higher. These are actual annual layers that you see here, They're about a meter thickness. Uh, there's a very distinct wet and dry season in the tropics, and you see that in glaciers and mountain tops. I took that photo in 1977, and if you look at the, uh, that place in 2002, mm -hmm. you can see the, the problem. And the problem is we're losing the ice, which is a water resource for the people there, but we're also losing the history. Once the ice melts, that record is gone, and it's gone forever. Even if the climate would cool, we can start over. So uh, getting that history in the past is there are many things recorded in ice, and this is just a few of them. And when we talk about temperature, we can talk about atmospheric chemistry. We can see when lead was put in gasoline, we can see when the Clean Air Act was passed and was taken out. And we're very good reporters of whatever is in the atmosphere. You can get a precipitation history by measuring the thickness of these layers and how they change through time. Uh, you look at vegetation through pollen, through the ice, uh, volcanic history, the sulfates. Anthrogenic conditions and uh, gases and bubbles. You look at microorganisms trapped in the ice, and uh, the, the, there are uh, actually many things trapped in ice. Uh, uh, if you wouldn't think at 22,000 feet, you would find things like insects. They get uh, pulled up through the convective cells, and they come out and they are perfectly preserved. And they can be identified, and they can also be carbon 14 data, so which is uh, uh, an independent time scale on your ice cores for the recruiting sections. Uh, to say, tell a little bit about the drilling, this is what a lightweight drilling system looks like. These were designed to go here from Ohio State. Uh, this is doing the Okaya ice cap. And we have two main types of drills, electromechanical. These are very much like you have in the oil business. They have teeth. And they physically cut the ice. Uh, and if you, uh, the core actually goes up uh, in, into the barrel. The, uh, because it is ice, you can also use a thermal drill and melt our way through. But because the ice we drill is below freezing, if you just use a thermal drill, the water that you produce here at the head of the drill would freeze the drill in and you would lose it. So there's a chamber in here in which we fill with antifreeze, and the ice enters the barrel, there's pressure on the chamber, this piston, and it projects an antifreeze that comes on the outside down through the tip. So that we, uh, we keep the hole open as we, as we go. We also designed power systems. We produced the first solar powered ice core drill here in the Ohio State. And uh, it works beautifully at 20,000 feet in the tropics. If you have over half the Earth's atmosphere below you, so you have 20 to 30 percent above manufacturer specs powered output. We designed uh, diesel generators that will run in a cold climate. 20,000 feet, you can't run them in Columbus, but they blow up and bore out the chambers, so that's what we do to provide power at higher elevation. And uh, 
these records come from uh, really remote parts of the world where we really don't have a lot of information. And so they, they help fill the, fill the gaps. Of course, you have to have labs in which to do the analysis. So over the first time, we have clean rooms where we do chemistry and dust measurements. We have mass specs to measure isotopes of oxygen and hydrogen in the ice cores. We have a, a freezer uh, where we now have over 7,000 liters of water stored at minus 30 degrees C. Uh, it's the only tropical collection on Earth. We didn't start out to do that, but that's what we ended up with. And as I'm going to show you, because these glaciers are disappearing, uh, it, it won't be long before some of these sites you only find the ice core here at the last thing. And then uh, we design and build the drills. You can go out to Sears and buy a drill. You know, the, it has to be lightweight and portable, so you can put it on a course or a gap or whatever it is, depending on where you are. So these are the places that we drill around the world. And it's kind of, a, kind of looking at the global climate as it's preserved in ice. Our latest site is in the Alps. We uh, before that over in the beginning. Most people don't even know that there's ice in the beginning. Uh, but it's the only ice field between the Himalayas and, and the Andes. Uh, I think we forget that we live on a sphere. Because of that, we have 50% of the surface of this planet from 30 degrees north and 30 degrees south. Uh, we have 70% of that 7 billion people living in that zone. So it's an area that we need to understand how the climate has worked in the past and also what the human impact is. If you look at the tropics, uh, 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 these are sea surface temperatures, and then if you look at precipitation, you see how they're late. Uh, if you get up to 500 millibar levels, up where the glaciers are, temperatures are very uniform. And we're getting a very similar response in all the glaciers uh, in this zone. As, uh, I'm going to take you just to one ice field to kind of give you an idea of uh, what that's like. This is the largest tropical ice cap on the planet. We didn't know that when we first went there back in the mid-70s, but we know it now because we've been around the world uh, looking at sites. This is what the ice cap looks like. It's 90 degrees south of the equator. Uh, when I started working here, it was 56 square kilometers. It's now 34 square kilometers. Uh, this is what the top looks like, and the Amazon Basin is just off to the right. This uh, is what an ice core looks like. It's coming out of the room. And uh, uh, one of our challenges has always been getting those back to our best days and keeping them frozen mm -hmm. when we come out of the tropics. If you look at the mass on this ice field, you can see every dry season. And if you go down into the glass, you can see how uniform these layers are. And because they're so uniform, you can measure the thickness and you can get the precipitation of the mass. I'm just going to give you <laughs> some quick examples of how we date these cores. Uh, there's an annual dust layer. And there's an annual variation in ice streams. And so it's very much like a tree ring. You just date them when you drill them back a few times. Uh, if you go back further in time, you'll notice that the layers start getting compressed uh, because the ice is just this fluid. And uh, uh, Spanish arrived in this part of the world in 1531, and the first records that we can interpret start after that. But the ice core was reporting, or the glacier was reporting, the events well before that. This is 1240 to 1330 AD. It's a very accurate history of the past. And you can look at the reproducibility of these records. Uh, this is the Cato isotopes. This is our temperature proxy. Reds are warm, blues are cold. This is a 20th century here on the top. And you see the enrichment that's taking place, the warming that's taking place uh, in this region. You can do the same thing with precipitation. The browns are dry periods. Blues are wet periods, and if you look at the 20th century, it's actually been wetter than normal. But as I'm going to show you, all the glaciers in this zone are retreating. Uh, we can work with anthropologists and archaeologists, uh, looking at people in this part of the world before uh, we had uh, written records that we didn't understand. The Incas, uh, uh, the pre Inca cultures, and you can take the ice core record and compare to the lines and follow cultures and where those cultures were growing uh, and uh, disappearing and look at the role the time of play. Uh, in the precipitation history, the blues here are wetter periods and the highlands are southern Peru. And these are drier periods. And so if you were to look through time, 
This is the Mochi culture. It's a coastal culture. There's dry in the islands. And Mochi's uh, capital is on the coast. And if you go to the wetter period up in the islands, you see the development of Kiwanaku and Wari cultures, and the capital is up in the islands. And you go forward in time, you come into another dry period, and you again have coastal cultures, and the capitals move back to the coast. Then you come to the onset of the Inca Empire, which becomes wet again, and this is the largest empire until the Spanish arrived and destroyed. Now it's interesting to look at this long term history in respect to what's happening today. Uh, in the last hundred years, it's been better than average, but people are actually moving since the 1940s from the mountains to the coastal cities, the Nima, down in the desert, where there are huge water shortages already. And uh, they're looking for a better school, a better way of life. But in the long term history, people should be moving back to the islands because it's getting wetter in those, in those areas. And the question is whether our technology and our modern society can overcome those natural forces that have existed in the past. If you take all these ice core records in the tropics and you combine them, and you look at the last 2,000 years, this would be our temperature record, you see the low ice age here, and you see the warming in the 20th century. So you compare that to other reconstructions from the northern hemisphere, you see very similar trends, and what really stands out is the last 50 years. And I can tell you, having questions uh, of the U.S. Senate, Talk about isotopes a bit. We just kind of blaze over uh, some isotopes and how that's the relate to the temperature and the like. But the, what they do relate to is what's happening with the ice. And uh, this is Kelkaya ice gap in 1977. This is now all lake in this area. This is 2002, the backside of that lake. You see these walls, they're 30 meters high. You see a person here for a scale. And we found a plant deposit, a wetland plant deposit coming out this ice wall is retreated. And uh, this is what it looked like, and you can see the ice wall is right behind it. And so you can sample that, identify it, carbon date it. Uh, and uh, but what's really surprising here is how fast, this is 2002. These are the plants here, and this is uh, 2005, the plants are here. And you see how far the wall is retreated. As the wall continues to retreat, other plants are coming out, and we can collect those, identify them, and date them and uh, determine when was the last time uh, the ice cap was as small as it is today. So these, uh, this is uh, one of the plants, uh, this is uh, uh, 5,200 years in age. And uh, so, so it gives us kind of a time frame for that uh, tree. Now, this ice cap continues to retreat, and there are the trunk loads of these plants being exposed. This is all plant covered. Uh, this is a lake uh, in another part of the glacier back in 2001. This is the same place in 2011. Uh, we collected plants out on this peninsula that were exposed. Those plants are now all about 6,000 feet in the So you can look at took uh, about 1,600 years of the ice to advance from here to here. It took 35 years for the plants back to retreat back to where it is. When you start getting some idea of how the ice is behaving in the past. So uh, nature's best thermometer uh, is probably the ice. And I like this quote from Henry Pollock's 2009 book. Ice asks no questions, there is no argument, there is no newspapers, there is no debates. It's not burdened by ideology and it carries no political values, it changes from solid to liquid. It just matters. And now I'm going to take you very quickly around the world to show you what's happening in glaciers. This is up in the Brooks Range, northern Alaska. This is a photo from 1958, another one in 2003. 100% of the glaciers in Brooks Range are retreating from the day of Southeast Alaska. This is the Muir Glacier. It was 800 meters deep when this photo was taken in 1941, it's probably in 2004. And just remember, when ice is with water on land, Helps goes into the world's oceans and contributes to sea level rise. And the Himalayas, we brought in data on what's happening in the glaciers throughout the world. Uh, this is a photo from 1921. You see the glacier in this valley. This is the same place in 2009. You see the change. We just had a paper in Nature in July where we looked at over 7,000 glaciers uh, that the Chinese have been monitoring for the last.
last 30 years. In the 30 years of those glaciers measured, 9% uh, of the area has disappeared. Uh, now, there are 46,000 glaciers in this part of the world, so we have a representative of all of those glaciers. But, uh, but they're definitely, uh, definitely key. Go to the Alps. We had some old photos that were in that part of the world. This is 1903. This is what uh, this way, these glaciers look like in uh, 2005. 99% of the glaciers in that region are retreating. Go to the Andes. The, the oldest monitored glacier now is El Valle. I started looking at that when I was a graduate student at Ohio State. And we've continued to monitor uh, the retreat of this Corey Davis glacier. This is what it looked like in 78, no lake. 2008, the 84-acre lake is 60 meters deep. Uh, didn't exist until 1991. And you can look at uh, this is the Ice Cap, which is Corey Davis. You can look at satellite images. This is Landsat five images. This is 1988, uh, and this was all ice in 1988. Uh, by uh, 2006, uh, this is you see the lake in here. And if you look at the change that's taken place in yellow, uh, we've lost 24% of the area of ice cover in the area of Granola and 14% of the Ohio ice cap. So these glaciers are, are disappearing very rapidly. Uh, we drill, have been working in China now for about 30 years, using places to drill. Very important area. Uh, geopolitically, it's a very important area because many of these rivers, like the Indus, Actually, photos from China, Pakistan, and India, all nuclear power countries, and all the middle water from the same river. So, what the role of the glaciers play in the water supply becomes very important. I'm just looking at one place here in Nanami. Uh, 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 that's at the source of the Ganges and the Ronald River, which goes north of the Himalayas, and the Indus River, which starts in the This is what the mountain looks like. If you make your way up through the, the valleys to the glacier, up on the top of the mountain, you see the drill down out here. Uh, we recovered three floors in bedrock, we're 158 meters in length. And uh, just a little bit about the transport. Initially, they're by Sherpas. When we get to the edge of the ice, you're still three or 4,000 feet above where the vehicles are down on the plateau. So then you have to use the local transport system to do that. We can get to these insulated boxes, six meters of pore, so 12 meters of react, five or 600 meters of pore. So you have to have a whole herd of these gas to move <laughs> down to the plateau. Then we make a dash to Lhasa, where there are freezers paid in the store. Now when we bring these pores back, the first thing we look for are the thermal nuclear bomb tests. All the nuclear tests we've done in the atmosphere have left the radioactive layer on the uh, ice fields, and we can measure them. This is from the Soviet test in 1962-63. These are all the previous cores uh, sites that we drilled. When we drilled Nanami in 2006, we didn't find them. And then we looked for uh, earlier tests. We looked for the IV test. This is the only nuclear test that was done at sea level, which before we understood how dangerous it is. And it produced a chlorine 36 spike that shows up on glaciers around the world. You don't see it on uh, and on. That means that there has been no net accumulation uh, uh, until at least 1950 on this ice field at the source of these, of these major rivers. And when you do a satellite image, you don't see this type of change. What you see is the area change. But they're also thinning uh, from the top down. Kilimanjaro in Africa. 1912, 2006, 85% of the ice cover has disappeared since late 2012. And we continue to monitor that ice field. This is sure from the glacier in the crater here. This is what it looked like in 2000. Uh, 2006, you can see it started to divide. Uh, by 2007, it's divided. And when you expose that darker surface, you can actually draw more radiation and get these positive feedbacks, and the glacier actually responds. Uh, this is what it looked like from uh, GS satellite in uh, 2010, and probably this year, this is organized in the Sausage And the last place I, I want to show you is the beginning. Uh, you know, this uh, ice field is up here near Kuka uh, This is 
what the oldest photos we could find looked like when we first came in 2001. Uh, we were able to look at some uh, Landsat images. Uh, this is uh, 1989, blue is ice. And then by 2009, you can see that many of these glaciers have totally disappeared. This one is very small. Uh, the the Marin Glacier in the valley here is one. Uh, the glacier here. Uh, so you can actually document uh, these changes in this place. This is what it looked like when we went there in 2010 to drill this ice field. And uh, it is the only ice field I've ever drilled here at Green Bear Day. Uh, and, uh, because it rained every day, this is where camp was studied. Over two weeks, we lost 30 centimeters of ice on the surface of the mountain. And the best way to know the glacier is rain, mm -hmm. because the heat transfer is direct. And if you, if, if that's any indication of what goes on on an annual basis here, you're losing by like seven meters of ice on the surface down every year. And we know from our, our drilling efforts that the maximum thickness is 32 meters. So uh, you can take uh, the images of areas of glaciers from Kilimanjaro uh, uh, and from New Guinea. Uh, Kilimanjaro on the red and the tops of uh, New Guinea. And you can project how it's changed in the past. And then you can kind of extend these in the future. The New Guinea glacier is going to disappear in the next five years yeah. if this rate continues. And uh, that has the uh, big implications part of the world uh, for the people who live there. The, uh, so if you look at the tropics, all these glaciers are disappearing, uh, and if you look at the time changes, they're accelerating as you come forward in time. So that's a, that's a common uh, feature. So if you look at the globe, all those red areas are places where we're losing ice uh, at the end of the 20th century, the end of the 21st century. So climatologically, we're not living familiar territory and the world's ice cover is just coming to matter. The sea ice in the Arctic is already lower than it has ever been this year since measurements were started. And uh, it's interesting to ask a very simple question. What would happen if we lost 8% of the ice on the planet? We've already lost 25% uh, uh, of the Delphi ice caps since I was a graduate school. But what if we lost 8% of the ice on the planet? What would that mean? Well, you can look at uh, the Gulf Coast, Florida, we lost 8%. This is what the coast will look like. Mm -hmm. So here we are now. 8% of the glaciers disappeared. This is what we look like. So the, the implications of this. So how to manage the world with uh, climate threats, rising sea levels, and rising energy consumption. These things are all going on. Uh, as it, as it the impacts are already being felt on the people who live in these areas. Uh, this is a, a lake in the form above our camp. And we chose the camp because of the constant water supply. Uh, in 2007, we were surprised to find that lake was totally off. It was at drain, going around this bend, underneath uh, the shrinking ice field and draining into a totally different valley. So the valley that it did go into has now dried up. The Alpaca Moss has died. And the local people no longer can graze their, uh, uh, their, their animals in, this, in the south. Uh, there are geo geological hazards that are forming, and all of these high mountain ranges, these lakes that form, uh, are approached very high uh, at the elevation. And on this lake, uh, uh, between 2005 and 2006, there was an avalanche, came off, fell into the lake. This is usually uh, pasture for alpaca and llamas. And the next year, when we were there, you can see this is all covered because there was a mini tsunami that uh, went down the valley and uh, filled the gaps uh, and raised them. So uh, these are, that lake formed in, in 1991. And these are all new things. And of course, the people who live in these areas, the professional community over here, they're already living right on the margin of existence. So these have an immediate impact. And this is one of my favorite quotes. There are three stages for scientific discovery. First, people will deny that it's true. Then they deny that it's important. And then finally, they'll go to one person. What's interesting about this statement that was actually made by Alexander von Humboldt, I would years ago. So human nature 
and science has not changed. I mean, we, the way we, uh, uh, and we bring about changes in science, it never really means changing the way we do science. And people don't like that. So uh, one of the questions that you can ask now is whether nature can change an intervening mind. And, uh, well, you can look at things like uh, these uh, number of uh, events, uh, natural disaster events in the U.S. Uh, in 2010, there were 247 of them. If you look at the breakdown, these the reds are earthquakes, losses, but these others, meteorological, rain and storm, hydrological or uh, floods and mass movement, and then there's ontological, which are temperature extremes and droughts and wildfires. You can see that curve increasing. So if you're a unique career, you're concerned about these things. And then, in 2004, uh, well, you asked this question because Skinner was concerned about is that immediate consequences outweigh the late consequences. Uh, once people start seeing the change, feeling the change, and see the cost of change, then uh, their attitude to the issues of climate change will also change. Uh, uh, just because of the way we are. So if you go into 2011, we go from major blizzards uh, to tornadoes in Alabama. And we've all seen these on, on the news. Tornadoes in Missouri. Uh, and then you look at the number of lives lost in 2011. Uh, and they're in red in this diagram. And uh, this is from tornadoes, which were unusually high. But then all of these is heat. Uh, uh, wind and uh, floods, and these are the averages for 10 and 30 years. And so, if you're an insurance company, you're concerned about these things because uh, these are costs. And uh, if you uh, if you're a human being with a family, you're concerned about these things because it could be your family. And, and it's not just uh, not here in, in the U.S. You go to Russia, fires, you go to uh, flooding in uh, Pakistan. And so in 2011, according to the 23, the overall losses were $148 billion, and the insured losses were $55 billion. That means someone else will cover what wasn't covered by, by the issue. Got into this year, there was ice in the canals in Venice in the winter. Uh, of course, the drought that started in Texas uh, in 2011 has continued into 2012. In fact, uh, uh, in July, we had over 60% of the U.S. was in either moderate or extreme drought conditions. And that affects crop production, food prices, and all these things. And uh, then the unusual heat on top of that. In March was very unusual. It's like July, July and March. Uh, these are the temperature extremes. Uh, departure from normal, 8 degrees Fahrenheit all through our region. And during that month, 15,000 more picture records were broken in the U.S. Mm -hmm. uh, so the, uh, and then again, it's, it's global. This is over the Black Sea of Russia, floods, uh, fires. There's a lot of fires out in, in the West, in Mexico, Colorado. And then it uh, brings one of the other issues that Skinner had with consequences for the individual outweigh consequences for others. The more and more people are individually, the more people who are being impacted by these changes, then they take on the more real here and now type of meaning. Uh, in Greenland this year, uh, this was July 8th, this is July 12th, there were four days when there were 97% of the top of that ice field was melted uh, at the days ago. So, uh, uh, these are these are huge changes we have to play. So this comes in some of the rural area of the U.S. Uh, it is not the strongest of the species that survives, but the most intelligent that survives. It is the one that is the most adaptable to change that survives. Is that correct? Well, we as individuals and groups and nations, in contrast to evolution, can understand our circumstances and deliberately make appropriate changes. We could do that. Uh, so the way I see it, 
for the perfect storm group. Uh, and it, it will come from the fact that CO2 has such a long uh, lifespan, the fact that there's an inertia in our climate system. We will not see the impacts of the current increases in greenhouse gases for 20 to 30 years. But you have to warm up the oceans, you have to warm up the ice sheets. All that takes time. There's positive amplifying feedbacks in the system. You melt the ice, expose the land or the ocean, no radiation is the water. Uh, and we have a fossil fuel yes, local. So there are uh, alternatives, fossil free fuels, clean air, water, economic development, the jobs. These are these are possibilities. I mean, it's interesting. If you look now, 80,000 people are employed in the U.S. in coal mines. Over 100,000 are employed in solar uh, in the solar energy field. So it's changing, but it's, it's a slow, slow process. So I think we have three options for society. We can choose to take measures to reduce the pace and magnitude of the changes in the global climate that are caused by human activities. And examples of these are reducing the emissions of greenhouse gases. We can talk about enhancing sinks for those gases. We can even talk about geoengineering to counteract the warming effects of greenhouse gases. We can talk about adaptation. It means taking measures to reduce the adverse impacts on human well-being that result from climate change that will occur. Examples would be changing agricultural practices, strengthening defenses against climate-related disease, building more dams and dikes. But we're not very good at predicting the regional impacts of climate change. And then the finally, it's suffering. The adverse impacts that are not avoided by either mitigation or adaptation. And that's really our, our, our options that we want to take. Now, changes are taking place. I mean, conservation, increased efficiency, more people mine, fuel efficient cars. Uh, these are all, all good. And we have renewable energy, fuel cells, renewable emission coal burning power plants, uh, solar, geothermal, energy recovery, ethanol, wind power. There are a lot of things taking place. We're looking at mass transit, light rail, ways to move people without cars, housing designs for compact cities, so you don't have to go so far. You have to go shopping and things like that. Nanotechnology, LED technology. And you can even talk about what you can do, individuals. And here is a list of some. Uh, and we can all play a role in this. But what is very clear, that these will not change the course that we're on. I mean, the most important thing that we are are citizens. And if citizens are not shoppers, we'll hold the key to a better world. Uh, I believe that the big idea is that we have to change the system. We have to change the economic system that we're based on. And you expect to have continuous growth uh, at the rates that we now expect uh, with 7 billion people enrolling and limited resources in the planet. And it's a too big of a problem for individuals or groups or political parties. So uh, it's very large. So I think this time around it requires a public awakening. That may come through the extreme climate events, weather events that people are starting to experience around the world, establishing a political will, uh, resetting up priorities, uh, sacrifice for the future, and an alliance of governments, business, and citizens. Can't be done unless everybody would get the same way. So our greatest challenges in the 21st century will be learning to get along with each other. That's been with us for a long time. We can question how well we're doing that. And then the other part is learning how to get along with the planet in which we live and depend for uh, our way of life. And I think these two challenges go with human behavior more than anything. And how we respond. I'll close with this view uh, of the Earth. And certainly, if we've learned anything from our international space program, is how unusual the Earth is uh, for life that we know. And when we talk about uh, global climate change, nature is a timekeeper on this. And unfortunately, none of us can actually see the clock. We don't know how much time we have to bring about the changes that are going to be necessary to change the course. So with that, I'd like to close. Thank you very much.
psychology because he needs to survive a severe depression. <laughs> <laughs> if any of you survived that depression, would like to ask a question. I'm sure you'd be glad to entertain questions for a few minutes. I just wonder how you deal with the Congress when you go and talk to them about climate change, given that at least one of our major political parties is denied that climate change is happening. How do you deal with that as a scientist? Well, that's tough. There are some really good people in Congress. There are some really good senators. And uh, so I try to focus on the positive rather than the negative. They're, 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 I mean, when I look at human beings, I kind of see a bell curve. There are chains on both ends. But in the middle, there's about 80% that I think that if you present a good case, uh, that you can sway. You know, there are a lot of other uh, issues beyond climate change that people can deal with. And, uh, uh, but I, I think that uh, my feeling is that the change is not going to come from Congress. It's going to come from people. It's going to come from the bottom up. Uh, it's unfortunate, but this is what I believe, is that most of the people in Congress don't really represent majority of Americans. I mean, the Pew uh, report, the latest report, and that's before this extreme summer, uh, brother we had, had 6% of Americans believe that global climate change is a serious issue, uh, uh, 6 out of 10. And so that means only four are out there denying the issue. And uh, I just got a, uh, a uh, card from uh, Senator Carter from Delaware saying that his names were changing in the Senate. On the climate change issue. I, I think what is changing is people who vote for these people to say, you know, what's going on? You know, I just lost my house. I just lost my family. Uh, and and I, I think they're all elected at the end of the day. And there are over 300 million of us. And uh, I think 300 million can overcome a few vested interests to control a lot of these people. They still have to be elected. At the end of the day. So, so it's a but I, you know, I, I try to stay in the center on these things. So, so if I get a request from a, a, a Democrat, I'll go. If I get a request from Senator McCain, I'll go. I would get him off invited. I probably wouldn't. <laughs> <laughs> so, so, you know, I think it's a reasonable people. Uh, <laughs> Well, but, uh, to me, this is an issue of resources. 
there is a huge vested interest out there to keep things as they are. Uh, when uh, the Obama administration took over, they had two big objectives. One was alternative energy and one was health care. And they floated both of these. And in the health care issue, there were a lot of uh, doctors, a lot of uh, hospitals, pharmaceuticals, they thought this was a good idea. Probably because they saw it was a good idea. In any event, they supported it. Whereas on the energy side, there was a huge $100 billion, uh, $100 million campaign directed at uh, uh, sending out what is really disinformation. Uh, and you've all seen the clean coal ones. I mean, I grew up in West Virginia. And coal is not clean. <laughs> it is. It's the biggest CO2 emitter that we have. Uh, but uh, they also had a campaign to discredit the climate. Uh, so, so I think that uh, then they went out to climate science. So I, I had uh, Church of Christ writing letters about, you know, if you just publish paper, this is just cool. And you all know there's only four, there's only four thousand. <laughs> <laughs> so you have to look at the paper coming out for you. <laughs> Thank you. 